Have we found the greatest arbitrage opportunity ever? You're in the right place, folks, because this is where the money is. Welcome to the show. I'm Matt Copenheffer. This is David Hansen. It is Friday, David, and that means today is our interview show. We've got a great interview today with Joe Mager, mm -hmm. Inside Value, end of the Motley Fools, Australia office, Australia services. That'll come a little bit later in the show, but first, David, China is angry over President Obama meeting with the Dalai Lama. I understand the politics going on over there, but at the same time, it's the Dalai Lama. I feel like that's like getting mad at somebody for watching Sesame Street. China, China, China people, Chinese government. Is it, we always refer to China Every, as everybody, just like every, China. <laughs> this huge thing, or it's just China. It's, it's the land. It's is the, anybody, who is the quote from? The quote? Do you even know? Was there a quote? It was, it was the Chinese government. Okay. Just, they're, they're angry. It just said, quote from Chinese government. Yeah, they're angry. They will, they will cut you off if you, if you tick them off. All right. Well, I don't have a meeting with the Dalai Lama, so I'm not too worried about it. You wish you did. I wish I did. All right. Let's, what I referred to in the intro, let's get to that first headline. Bitcoin aficionados wash their hands of Mt. Gox. This is from the FT. David, is this, is this Mt. Gox thing setting up one of the greatest arbitrage <coughs> opportunities? We were looking at this yesterday, and right now you can go, uh, or at least at that point, you can go on Mt. Gox, the, the Bitcoin exchange, the, mm -hmm. the under fire Bitcoin exchange, and buy Bitcoins at $110 each. Can't get them out of there. That's the whole thing right now. Mt. Gox has basically said, eh, our systems aren't working too well, so you can buy Bitcoins. You just can't take them anywhere. I don't think they're being that nice about it. I They're slamming the door closed. <laughs> you are not getting out. But you can look. You, you can buy them for one hundred and ten dollars each. Mm -hmm. And if you look over at other other non, we've shut the door on you. Uh, Bitcoin exchanges like Coinbase, Bitcoin's still up at like five hundred and fifty, six hundred dollars each. So that if we consider that the the right or the current or the reasonable price for a Bitcoin right now, why wouldn't you go into Mount Gox? buy up a whole bunch of bitcoins, sit on them there at Mount Gox, wait for them to get things figured out, hopefully they get things figured out, and then when they do, sell them, sell them at Mount Gox or sell them at Coinbase or spend them or do whatever you want. Live, because live high on the hog. Because you don't know if they're ever going to fix it. This isn't a new thing with a bitcoin well, exchange Well, you don't get a six, six to one risk reward without some risk there. There have been other bitcoin exchanges that have literally shut down and taken everyone's money with them. So there's precedent for this to happen, and that's the worry here. Yes, it does make sense if you're willing to risk that and lose your entire investment. Six times upside. Is it worth it? I don't know. Why aren't you doing it? I don't know. You, you know, the, the one thing that I actually thought about with this, well, one reason that I'm not doing it, or, or that I'm not really even seriously considering doing it, is that you have to be, you have to get verified on Mt. Gox to be able to hook up your bank account to it. The verification process, they're saying, is taking like 10 business days right now. And to do that verification process, you have to send them copies of personal documents, in, including a government-issued ID and proof of current residence. And given the security concerns that they have going on right now, I don't feel all that good about sending that kind of documentation That's fine. to them. Not, not only that, I just sent after... all that information to a Nigerian prince that emailed me the other day, so. It's well, how much, did he, how much did he offer? He promised me like a million bucks. Well, that's, that's an even sense. better opportunity. <laughs> that's an even better opportunity. Exactly. But, but even after that, then you gotta hook up your bank account. So, so this arbitrage opportunity, he, well, here's the thing. There's a reason it's such a widespread. Well, here's the thing. How much different is this from the Fannie Mae uh, common share situation that we keep talking about on here? Because basically you got the same thing. You've got something of value that's locked up by somebody, in, the, in that case, the federal government, mm -hmm. and you know it's worth more, it's, it's potentially worth more outside of that, of that lockdown, but you don't know if it's gonna make it outside of that. Is this basically the same situation? If the government lets Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac go, go back to the private markets, roll over into some new entities, could be a big five, six X windfall for the people owning common shares. How much different is the situation? It's a good point. It's, it really isn't much different, but it's just the question of what's the possibility of you losing everything. That, that the, the probability of a zero outcome. Right. If, you, if, if I made you choose between these two situations, which one would you rather, would you rather go, go with? Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Why is that? Because there's at least a legal structure around what they're working with. Whether you believe that the Treasury 
uh, usurped those legal <laughs> legal structures to take uh, the dividend from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. You're dealing with Mt. Gox, a company that is located in Japan. You don't have the same rights as Japan a Japan isn't exactly a, a no, country like without a rule of law. But I'm just saying I would rather We're not have talking about Nigeria here in the, 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 the Fannie Mae princess. The Fannie Mae case is already being heard by, there's been suits filed to say whether it was illegal, what the government right. did. So you at least have the rule of law somewhat on your side here as opposed to Mt. Gox. So. Or not. Or the government just says, we don't really care. We'll see. You'd ra- so you'd rather go with Fannie Mae. What about you? Fannie Mae. All right. Next headline. <laughs> Second headline. BBVA buys U.S. digital bank Simple to increase online offering. For those of you who don't know what Simple is, this is kind of a front-end consumer platform. Uh, very, very nice looking, uh, very easy to use. It is. It's really pretty. It's an app on your phone, your iPad, wherever. You'd think it, would co- you'd think it is an Apple product. But it is not. In, Simple itself is not a bank. It uses the Bancorp Bank. The Bancorp Bank. Bancorp Bank. Greatest is bank the, name ever. Is the FDIC bank that's actually behind the service. So that's where your deposits are actually sitting. It's not at a, a simple branch. Interesting move here. And we haven't really talked about this business model of having a front end service and kind of a Bancorp Bank behind the scenes. Is this well, we, that's I, interesting? We, we've covered it just a little bit from the perspective that we interviewed Ron Suber right. over at Prosper, and Prosper offers security services, so they need uh, they need this kind of white label bank service, mm-hmm. so they get that from a different bank. That's what the Bank Corp Bank does. They they do. That's not who Prosper works with, but that's who Simple works with. Just yesterday, we were talking about something similar to this, and and, and I said that I didn't think it was likely that Facebook or Google or Amazon or Apple is going to get into the banking business because they didn't want to deal with all of the regulations of that highly regulated business. Maybe I got to quickly turn 180 degrees on that because this is actually this is actually a pretty interesting idea for any of for any of those companies is that they could create the front end some great front end user friendly service easy to use uh, offers offers value to the consumer through great online software and then partner with a bank that offers these sort of private label banking services. I think it is a good idea. It makes a, it makes a lot of sense. It just has to be marketed the right way as a secure thing. I think that would be the first sure. concern for everybody is, I don't want my bank account to show up on my news feed on Facebook. That would be embarrassing for some people. Unless it's not embarrassing. Unless it's not embarrassing. <laughs> um, of the companies that you mentioned, I think Google has the, the biggest opportunity here and is the most likely to do something like this. We know they dip their hands into everything. They do have an investment in the peer-to-peer lender, Lending Club. So they're obviously interested in the finance business. Mm -hmm. They make great experiences, whether it be Gmail, Google Plus. You could argue whether that's a great experience. Doesn't have a huge following. I think it actually is a great experience. It just doesn't doesn't have have the, yeah. The the service that that Facebook does right now. So I wouldn't be surprised if we saw Google move into the space over the next five years. I'm pegging it at a 25% 25% chance. Do you, do you think there's any concern over the, Google has come under fire so many times for privacy issues. Do you think if they start getting into banking, that just fires up all over again? It's all, all of a sudden, they not only have, your, have access to your email, to potentially your social connections, uh, your search history, but now they have a direct line into your bank account. I mean, not really, they right. wouldn't be able it's to. All about, I think it would be all about marketing and making sure it's secure and convincing people that it's fine. I don't know, would you ever consider banking with Facebook, Amazon, Google? It depends on the kind of services that they offer. I, I mean, I, I'm not too tied to, to the bank that I'm with a, any more than I appreciate the services that it, that it offers. I'm actually in the process of switching banks right now because the one I'm with I haven't been particularly happy with. So what I'm looking for is, is a good upfront, uh, upfront user experience and also any perks in terms of Frankly, the bank that I'm probably going to be switching to is Bank of the Internet because they pay a lot on deposits. Right. So I'm willing to go after that. I would think Amazon has a good shot here too in terms of offering uh, b- banking or, or finance solutions. I, I agree with you that I would think that Google it would be my first pick in terms of probability. But in terms of security, people are already doing lots and lots of yeah. transactions with Amazon. They have all of these back-end services, working with merchants, providing white label solutions to merchants. So, so I think that in terms of people feeling secure banking with one of these companies, uh, I think Amazon would be a good, good choice. All right. Third headline, firm stops giving high-speed traders direct access to releases. 
It's kind of a weird headline, firm. I, it's always weird when somebody calls something. Firm here refers to Business Wire. Business Wire is the press, press release company, we can call it, I guess call it that, yep. owned by Berkshire Hathaway. Basically what was happening is Business Wire was selling direct feed access to high speed traders so that they could, any time a press release was fired off, they would get it sooner, they would process it, they would cr word crunch When you it. say sooner, it was like, a it millisecond. Was like, yeah, it was like, like a microsecond. Yeah, microseconds. So it's not like they're getting it a day before. No, 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 no. Um, I guess you would call it a word crunch it. This isn't number crunching. They mm -hmm. would word crunch it to figure out how to potentially trade that news release and then do the whole high speed trading thing mm -hmm. and make a little bit of extra money, potentially. Right. But uh, regulators got involved here. This wasn't illegal. This wasn't an illegal thing that was going on. But regulators got involved and now Buffett has stepped up and basically said, you know what? We're just not gonna do it. Yeah. Not gonna do it, doesn't look good. Is this another example of Buffett looking to have him and his company beyond, uh, be beyond reproach? Or is he too late? I mean, is he late to the game here? That this had been going on. It, this had been going on already. I don't and think he's he, only responding after the news. I don't think he's news. late to the game. He's not at the, at the meetings for Business Wire. This is such a tiny, you're not even gonna find business wire stuff called out in any Berkshire filings, really. Maybe a I'll sentence. Find a, you're not gonna find a lot of the Not a lot, business. I mean, this is, this is very, very small. Uh, so I, I think it's a good business decision, just hitting this up front. It's not a great headline. It's not a big deal to the overall business, so just move on with it, right? So this, this makes you, does this make you more positive about Buffett, more cynical about Buffett, or basically doesn't change your opinion? Doesn't change. What about you, same? I'm not answering. All right, that's fine. Same. Let's go to the I'll mailbag. Go, go to the mailbag. We have an email address. It's WTMI at fool.com. You can send us questions. You can send us comments. You can send us corrections. We get a lot of grammar corrections on here. Yeah. Apparently, I miss say a lot of things on this show, like begging the question the other day. We, we got a, a, an emailer writing in, educating me on what begging the question actually And we means. looked so, at it for five minutes and I still don't really understand. We, we did, we did. So if, you're, if you are sending us emails to WTMI at fool.com, they're getting read, they're being appreciated, even if we don't have time to respond to every one of them or address them all on the show. Let's get to the question for today. This comes from Ryan. Ryan says, I've been following GE, General Electric, for a while now because I believe they are a stable company with a fairly strong dividend. Even though it's still a few months away, what do you think of them potentially spinning off GE Capital. Is it a good idea to have GE Capital on its own? On a side note, if you own shares of GE, would a portion of those shares be transferred to GE Capital? David, you did a little bit of research on this GE Capital situation yep. this morning. What are your thoughts? So they're not spinning off the entire GE Capital thing later this year, all in one fell swoop. They're spinning off their North American consumer lending business. So this is basically private label credit cards. Companies like Walmart use them to give out credit cards, et cetera. So they're spinning off the North American consumer lending and they're only gonna float around 20% of the IPO. Mm -hmm. So GE is still gonna hold on to the rest of the business and over time, slowly get rid of that as it makes sense because it doesn't make sense to just completely dump the whole business all at once as they see it right now. Um, Apparently, the company will be valued right around $20 billion based on some comps. Discover is probably the closest comp in terms of business model mm -hmm. providing consumer... Uh, Direct consumer lending. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think it's a good move. Um, GE obviously got into some trouble during the financial crisis. It doesn't make a ton of sense. Sometimes it makes... Well, GE Capital makes wasn't... Sense together. GE Capital know. wasn't one of the worst offenders, right? No, but it still wasn't a great time for the business. No, it wasn't. And, 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 it's, and it's sort of a... a would you would you say it's a distraction for the rest of GE? Because I, I mean, they've said it was a distraction. They've come out and said, "Hey, look, the, the problem." Well, anything is we a making, distraction when your when your whole company is at risk and you have to reach out to Warren Buffett and, and pay exorbitant. Well, they they even said that it was a distraction before the crisis because the profits were so good in that area. Why do anything is, else? Everyone is looking at GE Capital as opposed to the why make business. why make a new turbine when you can just right. earn more. So so it. they realize that this isn't right for them and they're slowly getting rid of it. Um, I think it's a good move. Are you gonna be a buyer after the IPO? Of the North American consumer lending? Yeah. I don't know, I'd have to see the price. Now, here's, here's the, actually here's the really interesting question here. Joel Greenblatt, in, in one of his early books, talked about spin-offs being a great place for value investors to look because when a unit of a company gets spun off, 
it's often overlooked yeah. by by institutional investors and that sort of thing. Now, twenty billion dollar spinoff not is, be overlooked. Is, isn't the kind of thing that, that gets easily overlooked. But owners of GE, uh, like Ryan, may not be as interested in GE Capital. Do you think GE Capital potentially gets undervalued? At, because when we think about IPOs normally. So we've got this King Media IPO with Candy Crush yeah. coming to the market. Almost guaranteed that that's going to be overpriced when it comes to the market. Almost guaranteed. Mm -hmm. But when G Capital comes to the market, think there's a chance that maybe this is a, a better value than, than the typical IPO? Probably. Than the typical IPO that we've been seeing over the last couple of years, yeah. But like I said, if I was looking at these Discover and them, and they traded at the same valuation when the, this unit goes public, mm -hmm. I would much rather have discover. Okay. Uh, I like the business model better there, the, how they own the relationship a little bit more. Consumers don't really know they have a GE credit card. No, that's you true. Have a wall, I mean, it, it's kind of just they need. A, they the need a, do, do you think when it, it, as a standalone business, maybe it starts to brand itself a little better? I mean, maybe that's part of the strategy once it gets off on its own. That would make it a little bit more interesting. A little bit more interesting. A little bit. All right, let's go ahead and cut away to that interview with Joe Mager now. Uh, it's a great interview, and we will be back to close out the show. Here today with Joe Mager, the lead advisor for Motley Fool Inside Value, and one of our advisors all the way out in Australia. We are on Google Hangouts because, of course, Joe is in Australia. We're in the U.S. Joe, thanks for joining us. Good day. <laughs> well played. Well played. Yeah, I can't even get it with the accent right. Well, you'll you'll get it. I do my there. best. Yeah. It's been uh, two years, year and a half. I, a year, a year. Oh, you were still here when I moved here. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm quick, man. I'm just all over the world like that. All right, getting to the good stuff. On Inside Value, one of my favorite Motley Fool newsletters, because you show the love to the financial companies, and in particular, one of my favorites is one of your picks, uh, and that's Berkshire Hathaway. Joe, what are your thoughts on, on Berkshire and where it stands today? Sure. Well, I'm a, a long-time Berkshire fan, like a lot of people. I didn't actually start buying the stock personally until a couple of years ago, though, when it started getting down to around one times book. Uh, at that price, it was just obscenely cheap, and Buffett agreed and instituted a, a buyback program of 1.1 times book, and now you know, 1.2. So the stock's at 1.3 today. I, I think that's a nice price. Uh, probably got some upside to a fair value, maybe around 1.5. And there's not much downside, you know, with something like 1.2 being somewhat of a safety net beneath you. But that's all kind of, you know, uh, nickels and dimes, really. A big picture, this is a business that should be able to grow its intrinsic value at a faster clip than the broader market at a time where the market is not especially cheap. So, you know, you can invest in Berkshire, which is still a first-class business with first-class leadership. Um, that has an ability to reinvest in high rates for a long time through a lot of different business lines. And I know a lot of people have different concerns about you know, who's going to take over after Buffett leaves, and, and that's a valid concern, but to some extent I think that's already in the price. And you know, there are so many talented managers at Berkshire that I'm confident that they can figure out something. And at this price, I'm that much more confident that I can deal with it. What do you think when you, when you look ahead there's so many reasons to like Berkshire, uh, but what are the C's risks candies. that get you? C's, well, of course, C's candies. Is that is that your number one opportunity or number one risk for Berkshire? <laughs> uh, both. The peanut brittle is dangerously good. It is dangerously good. I, I imagine Charlie Munger is is right on the same page with you on that. Uh, so so when when you look forward, what, what about risks? What are the things that keep you up at night? Are, are there any things that keep you up at night in terms of owning Berkshire? Yeah, I mean, you know, one of these days, Warren is not going to be running the company anymore. And even though I think there are very high caliber people who can come in and both make operational decisions and capital allocation, as if you could separate those, but let's just loosely say that you can uh, with Berkshire. They're very talented people, very capable, very striking me as honest and able. None of them are Warren Buffett, right? I mean, he's irreplaceable. So there is that lost in the business when he's gone. So the business will miss him. I will miss him and uh, have a lot of respect for the guy. Uh, beyond that, I'd say that the two things that, that I wonder about, one is uh, on the mid-American side, I wonder sometimes about the longevity of 
you know, kind of regulated utility staying power. As obvious as that might sound, that there is a lot of staying power, and Mid American just run circles around all their competition locally. Uh, but I'm very mindful of you know, kind of this trend that I really think we're moving towards is people using at home solar generation uh, to push electricity back onto the grid. And to be fair, you know, Mid American has been extremely proactive among the major utility companies in America on the electricity side of working toward their own alternative energy sources that, that I think will treat them very well. But that's just something I'm mindful of that the the network effect and the scale advantages around their business in 10 years might look very different. Um, mm -hmm. And Uncle Warren is not always the most up to speed on, on such changes. Um, and then, you know, on the reinsurance side, even though the balance sheet is a fortress, and I've heard different stats about how, you know, it would take assorted monumental catastrophes to really ding the business. You know, reinsurance, you're you're basically betting on long tail events not happening, and long tail events do happen. <laughs> sure. And I realize that Ajit and his team are extremely good at pricing risk, but that's something I'm always a little bit mind blob at the tail. That one of these days we'll just wake up and there'll be a big bite taken out of the balance sheet. Not a fatal bite, but a bite. Well, that could also be seen as op an opportunity potentially, right? Because if they have the balance sheet that can handle that sort of risk, if that happens, it shakes out weaker weaker hands, weaker competitors. They get to finally raise prices in the reinsurance sector, which has just been brutal over the past few years. So uh, it could be an opportunity in disguise, potentially. Yeah, it's a silver lining. Silver lining. Yeah, that's a, that's a better way to, to put it. So moving from actual Berkshire to baby Berkshire, Markel. Uh, this is another uh, recommendation in the Inside Value newsletter, and it's a it's a favorite around here at the Fool and a favorite of mine. This is sort of a it's a very similar story to Berkshire in terms of insurance, in terms of capital allocation, in terms of now with Markel Ventures actually buying full businesses. What do you think is the biggest long term opportunity at Markel? I think the core business of insurance is what they're best at, and I. I know that Markel Ventures, I think Markel Ventures has a bright future. I think there's a lot of opportunity there for them. Uh, Tom Gaynor is an extremely good investor with an outstanding track record, and they've eased their way into investing in outside companies, owning companies. That said, I do think they're just outstanding underwriters, and Tom Gaynor is excellent at putting money to work in public markets. So as long as that could just continue to be the economic engine of the business, I'd be very happy. And I think that will definitely be the case for 5, 10, even you know, 15, 20 years down the line. I mean, you look at Berkshire, even though it's you know, diversified into all sorts of angles, I'd say insurance is still the real bread and butter of the business. And that'll probably be true of Mark Tullin for a long time. So when investors are... Go ahead, go ahead David. Um, looking at, you, you mentioned Tom Gaynor, and we always talk about him on the show around here at the office. If Tom Gaynor was to come in tomorrow and say, hey guys, I'm leaving Markel, how would your kind of opinion of the company change? Well, I'd be like, well, we're looking, if you're looking to join the Inside Value team, we're always looking for talented people. <laughs> uh, I'm sure he'd take us up on that. Um, yes, that, that would definitely be a, a big detraction for me. I mean, he's been in the market over 20 years, and I think that a key component of Markel's growth over time is going to be, uh, you know, growth and float. Or, Maybe not growth and flow, the management of that flow, the maximi maximization of that value. And yeah, absolutely. If, if he was gone, I would certainly rethink what I think is a fair price for the business. And at that point, I, I think, at least conservatively, you'd have to say, you can't bank on our performance on the equity side anymore. I think you have to be a little more grounded and say, we're going to get a market median return here, in which case you're going to see slower growth in book value per share. And I'd, I'd probably pay less for it. But the good news is uh, Gaynor's still young. He's in his 50s. Um, you know, from having talked to him, you know, the guy's been there a long time. He, he loves Markel. He loves Richmond. And I'd be surprised if he's still not you know, running money there in 20 years. All right, Joe, closing out here, we spend most of our time talking about U.S. financial companies and, and U.S. markets for obvious reasons. We're here in Virginia. Being over in Australia, how much different is the US, is the Australian financial system, and are there Australian banks or financial companies that you think are particularly strong and have your eye on? 
Um, there aren't any that I have my eye on, for sure. Uh, that's <laughs> mostly mostly valuation based. I mean, here's how I kind of put it. So most U.S. investors these days are looking at opportunities like Wells, which is selling for off the top of my head, what 1.4, 1.3 times book, something like that. You're getting our return on assets of one and a half percent. Here in Australia, the biggest bank, Combank, the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, is selling it. 2.6 times book and does a return on assets of 1.1%. So you're paying a very high price for what are not great results without boosting from leverage. And ComBank's levered about 16 to 1. So you know people are quick to point out they get great returns on equity. I'm like, wow, tons of leverage. Uh, that, that certainly will help you get there. So it's not a recipe that I generally like. Um, Australia's banks are known to be, and they are the most expensive in the world. Generally speaking, it's not a good idea to overpay for levered assets. Uh, so I'm, I'm not in a rush to buy any today. Um, that said, they are in a very good position competitively. So there's much more consolidation here in Australia. There are four big banks that basically dominate the market. That's likely to stay that way for a very long time and you know the reason the ROAs aren't any better by the way because you hear that and you're like well these guys should be a lot more profitable than they are uh, the reason is sure. that they get a lot of their money their funding is offshore so they have something like two-thirds of assets coming from deposits and you're like oh well, that's that's cheap low cost but then like another 20 percent is offshore which is very expensive so that's kind of what's uh, ruining the cocktail for them. But but anyway, I would happily own them at the right price. You know, just like any value investor, I'm, I can be bought. <laughs> but uh, yeah, for right now, I'd, I'd probably just be a little more patient. Uh, you know, something else, right? I mean, U.S. bank balance sheets are, are continually improving. Uh, you're seeing uh, loan quality has changed pretty dramatically, and it's on the upswing in the States. Um, here, I'd say you've got rising unemployment and asset prices are running pretty hot. So combine that with evaluations, and I'd probably just take a pass for right now. So it's an, it's an interesting thing you say about the fact that there are four really big banks that sort of run the show in Australia. We have the concern here about too big to fail in the U.S. It, it, are Australians concerned about that in their banking system? No. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Australians... You know, there hasn't been a recession here in 22 years, so there's not a lot of concern. That must be about. nice. Yes, and it's hard for me to tell between the weather. It, I don't know if it's the weather or the 22-year streak without a recession that has everybody so relaxed and carefree all the time. Maybe it's both. But, yeah, there's, you know, people here are concerned about the mining boom winding down, but no one, I, I never hear anyone talk about risk at the big bank. Never. That sounds like exactly the kind of time when risk would rear its ugly head at banks. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Joe. Well, on that uh, on that lively note, uh, we'll end it. Thank you so much for joining us, and uh, and hopefully we'll get you back on the show soon. Yeah, I'd love to. You guys do a great show. Thanks for having me. It's fun. And as fellow financial nerd, I, I love that there's there's more of a focus on that. So thanks for bringing it. Absolutely. Take care, Thank Joe. You. All right. Later, guys. It's great to talk to Joe there. So let's go ahead and close out the show, close out the week. David, what is our first tweet? Our first tweet is kind of a twofer. The first one is from Piers Grundy. He says, City CEO Mike Corbett recognized for bank success in 2013 with $14 million, a 23% pay raise. But we have another one. This one is from Austin Derrick. He says, at City, <clears throat> City apparently you get paid a lot for destroying shareholder value. CEO Corbett gets 23% salary bump. What's going on? I have brain exploding. Is he, did he destroy value? I, I don't think he did, but I also don't think he created a whole lot of value yet. He's only been there for a year. We were just talking about Moynihan at Bank of America yesterday and the pay raise that he got. Like I said at that time, or, or at that time yesterday, like I said yesterday, you can point to a lot of things that Moynihan has specifically uh, done, right. that he's presided over, <laughs> that he's accomplished at Bank of America. With Mike Corbat, not so much yet. You know, I'm a big fan of Mike Corbat, but I think 
we want to see him actually accomplish some stuff before we get too worried about whether his compensation is keeping up with the other Wall Street. And the people. stock the stock has done very well, but a lot of that is just the multiple the market is giving the right. business. It's not exactly him. The market's confident results. in Corbett. They are. Now the market's confident, but that's got to deliver. That, yeah, now he's got to deliver. All right. All right. Second tweet. We've got Nick Tamiros. Uh, Fannie Mae reported an eighty-four billion dollar annual profit for twenty thirteen. We were just talking about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac earlier. Eighty-four billion dollars. It's kind of the perfect. How much of that goes to common shareholders? Uh, common shareholders had a loss of one point four billion. <laughs> Sorry. That's painful. That's painful, and I don't mean to make light of that because the there is a very significant legal issue there and and the shareholders are, are fighting very hard to try to get access to those products. Now, 2013 was a very awesome year for Fannie Mae for a couple of reasons. It was also unusual year. <laughs> very unusual. Excluding the big tax benefit they got, uh, that income drops down to $38.6 billion. So $38.6 billion. But of that, we had a lot of lawsuits with the big banks, mm -hmm. repurchase claims that were kind of finally pulled through. That helped there. And loss reserves were $15 billion lower than they were in 2015. So they released a lot of reserves as well. Uh, and they've, they said in their filings, don't expect us to be this profitable going forward by anywhere close to $84 yeah, billion. Pa part of the problem with financial models oftentimes is that uh, people end up taking uh, a, a current year's numbers and just projecting them out do that. infinitely into the future. This is definitely not the year's numbers to use for Fannie Mae. But granted, 2009, 2010, those aren't the numbers to yep. use either. You, you really have to dig into the business here and understand what the what the sort of steady state Fannie Mae looks like if you're going to try to. They released their 10K too, so any Fannie Mae nerds want to dive in, go for it. Yeah, it's a good read. Promises to be a good read. Final tweet. Final tweet. First tweet was from Ivan the K says, the 2008 FOMC transcript dump is like a Netflix drama full series binge without pictures or sound, hashtag fed. And then Lawrence <laughs> DeLevine says, jack it off, ready to go. Is that how you're spending your weekend? No. I'm not that Why big not? of a nerd. Come on. So for those of you listening, the Fed has released transcripts of all of their meetings in 2008. So you can see what they said at the beginning of the year, what they said after the Lehman bankruptcy, et cetera. Some nerds out there are really excited. By uh, the way. You're yeah, excited. I'm pretty excited. I'm going I'm to take a look. I, I think it'll be potentially some interesting reading. By the way, one tweet we didn't include here that, that I should make note of, I got tweeted at yesterday. Remember yesterday I started off the show criticizing uh, the Canadian newspaper yes. for, for saying that Jimmy Fallon uh, is, is going to basically fail in, on The Tonight Show. And I got a tweet from a Canadian saying, asking me for, my, for their opinion on a bunch of other American things, because apparently, according to me, Canadians cannot have opinions about American things. That's fair. I deserve that. Well played. I told you. I, I know. I know. I usually, you. usually this is me making you eat crow. This time, I'm eating crow. You were wrong. My bad. All right. My bad. All right. That's our show for today. That's our show for the week. If you are listening to this on in podcast form. Uh, you might as well go to iTunes and give us a rating. Of course, that's going to be a five-star rating. Why wouldn't it be? If you're not listening to this on podcast form yet, if you're commuting, if you're working out, great way to listen to it. Go to iTunes, go to Stitcher, go to Swell. You can find us on any one of those. I'm Matt Kopenheffer. This is David Hansen. We'll see you next week. People on the show may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. Don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear.